Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Even though it's empty, we're here and the Lord is here. This might be the smallest crowd I've ever preached to in this sanctuary. I think it's about six, but the Lord is here and you are there. And we're so thankful that we're able to come to you in your home. And you're probably wiping tears like the six or seven or eight of us here, thinking of the goodness of God, that even though times are testing us, God is taking care of us. I felt like giving him a hand clap of praise a while ago, and I'm sure you feel like it in your house. We bless you today, Lord Jesus. Your word is true, your spirit is here, and you are father to your people. Thank you for this blessed, blessed day, Lord Jesus, this Lord's day. And again, we welcome all of you who are watching. We're live streaming, of course. This is 8.30, and it'll be played at the 10.30 service. And we have made it our duty and our privilege to stay in contact with you as long as this crisis continues. Uh, Pastor Greg has already told you about tomorrow night. We will have our prayer meeting. Of course, you won't be here. We'll have a few of the staff members and we'll pray with you and over you and for you. And then, of course, he mentioned pause. We've been doing that. In fact, started last Tuesday, uh, videoing, taping, whatever you do these days to give you, give you a word of encouragement during the week. We'll do that again this Tuesday. And, of course, you can see the instructions online, how to uh, uh, download it and make contact and enjoy just a moment or two of inspiration. Of course, that music was beautiful last week, and the word of the Lord helped us quite a bit. So join us. We won't miss a beat around here. It's lonely. Usually this place is bustling and people are shaking hands, but there's no one here. We don't know how long this will continue, but we, we want you to know that the ministry doesn't stop because the building is empty. I did talk with uh, Phil Miller, our CFO, and he said our ties and income are down by 50%. And we understand people have lost their jobs and they have no income. We are not uh, one bit worried about that because God said he'd supply our needs. I just want you to know you don't have to worry about um, going online and sending your tithes and offerings. It's very secure. Or again, you can just send it to the church, Central Church 5301, Sardis Road, Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, having said all of that, the main reason I came here today was to give you a word from the Lord. My goodness, as I sat there and listened to that music, that great choir, those wonderful musicians, my heart was stirred and I was thankful. And I, I had to just pinch myself a moment and realize that at least for the time being, all of that is suspended in this building Sure makes me appreciate it, I'll tell you that. Uh, to come on this campus and cars trying to find a parking place and people in the coffee shop and check, checking children in to the nursery and the youth are out in their building and uh, people just running around doing what Christians do, having fellowship. And as I said, for right now, that's on hold. But God is still at work. You see, when we can't work, God is still working. When we can't show up, God is never absent. So you can count on it. And listen to me now. God's doing something. This is not an idle time in heaven. This is not empty and void. God is at work bringing his world to his feet, bringing his church to his glory. So I thought I'd bring you something that the Lord just dropped in my heart yesterday afternoon. I was, I don't remember when it was, but again, I was watching one of those National Geographic shows and this happened to be on the polar bear. That's a fascinating animal. It's the largest uh, predator 
I, I, I think that's what they the largest predator on the earth, the largest carnivore, up to 2,000 pounds, can swim 200 miles, has such thick fur that it doesn't even notice the Arctic weather. And they said something very interesting to me. The polar bear has no natural predator except man. And then, for some reason said, and man himself has no predators. Then I thought uh, yesterday afternoon, thinking about that, oh yeah, man doesn't have a predator. Then why are the schools shut down and why is the church empty and why is the government in a frenzy? Because man does have a predator. And those predators don't weigh 2,000 pounds. And they don't have four legs necessarily. Those predators are invisible. A germ is invisible to the naked eye. You can only see it with a microscope and yet it's able to shut a world down. It's able to suffocate life out of a human being. A germ. A strains of germs. Oh, we're finding out. Yes, sir. Man does have a predator. But man also has a spiritual predator. And that's been going on since the Garden of Eden. There's been an enemy, a foe after mankind ever since God created man. And we are watching what happens when man tries to help himself. We're looking at it right now. You are seeing the heart of man. Instead of turning to God, instead of crying out to God, man is still saying, as he did right before the flood, let us make a tower to the heavens. Let us rebuild. We will triumph. We will win. We will come through this all without acknowledging the God of glory. That's man. That's the spirit of man. And that means that the spiritual predator, the devil, and evil, and darkness have so convoluted the thinking of man that he doesn't even realize that he needs help, doesn't realize he's infected and infectious. He's going to try to heal himself, help himself, and bring himself out of this. And of course, when man tries to do anything without God, he, he only creates confusion. Uh, can you tell? Confusion. Who in this world is not confused about something right now? Yeah, when man tries to fix it himself, it always gets political. It's never for the good of the body or the whole or the people. Even when man is desperate, he's political. It doesn't matter to some people if it helps humanity or not. They just want their beliefs and their ideas to be promoted. They want to be in power. And that's, you're watching that at work. Brother, it's at its supreme place right now. Politics and selfishness. And then, of course, when man tries to fix it himself, the blame game goes on and on and on. Have you noticed? Everybody's blaming somebody for something. But did you notice that first started in the Garden of Eden? God said, Adam, where are you? What have you done? He said, the woman the woman you gave me. And then when he turned to the woman, she said, the, the, the serpent. You see, it's just never man's nature to assume responsibility. He always wants to put the blame on somebody else. And then when the blaming starts, the accusing starts. Well, now, who do you think fallen humanity gets that from? It is the nature of Satan to accuse and so once we move into that realm of accusing this person after we've blamed that person, we've been infected pretty badly and we're operating in the power of the flesh and we have totally ignored God. And when the blaming and the accusing begins to manifest itself, then here comes the strife, division, hatred, anger. There it is. And you know what? stirs this, it becomes roiled. When everybody starts looking around instead of looking up, 
And then the rumors start. Oh, my friend. Now, I am assuming that most of you watching me right now are believers. You may belong to this church or some other church. I got an email the other day from South Korea. They were watching from an army base in South Korea. So I don't know where you are geographically, and, and I really don't know where you are spiritually. But <coughs> I can tell you this. If you get into the rumor game, you're getting into some kind of destruction that many, many people will never recover from. Rumors, uh, telling things that aren't true. The media is in this frenzy right now. All you have to do is go to this channel and they are blaming that group. Go to the other channel, they're blaming that group. And then they start saying, we have heard, it has not been confirmed yet, but our sources say. And that's when the rumors start and that's when it infiltrates the population and the thinking and the minds of people. And instead of facts, we base our feelings and our life on fiction because we really don't know what to believe. Let's be honest. Whichever side you're on, you don't know what to believe. You don't know who to believe. And whether we see it acted out physically right now or not, we're in a panic. It's on the inside. It's an uncertainty. It's an agitation. It, it's not knowing what to do next. It's being extremely sensitive and things upset you very quickly. That's a sense of panic. Pastor, how do you know what to do? Who do you believe? Who can we trust? Well, I'm going to tell you something this morning. All of that was an introduction to what I'm about to say right now. If Jesus Christ were standing right here, if Jesus were the ninth person in this sanctuary today and he were sitting right there where I was sitting, and if I were to invite him to the stage to say a word to you, I'm going to tell you exactly what he would say. Now, mind you, there are lots of people going around saying we need a word from the Lord. Oh, if we can get a word from heaven. They're trying to find a prophet. And prophets, are they're, they're out there in great numbers. They can tell you about whatever you want to hear and a lot of stuff you don't want to hear. Oh, if we could just find a prophet to give us a word from the Lord. I got one for you. If Jesus were to walk up one, two, three, four steps and stand right here where I'm standing, of course, I would be flat on my face. But here's what Jesus Christ would say. Let not your heart be troubled. You mean he wouldn't tell us more? He, he, he wouldn't enlarge on it? No, sir. He's already said it. It's perfect. It's always timely. There's nothing he could add to it. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he would say this, peace I leave with you. My peace <clears throat> I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. See, nothing changes. The Lord has spoken it. You don't need an addition to it. All you need to do is read it and be reminded that when the Lord speaks, it is spoken forever. And he speaks and says to us in this situation right now, believer, Son of God, daughter of the Most High, you don't need to be troubled. You're not of this world. They're the ones in a panic. They're the ones operating in fear. They're the ones spreading the rumors. You don't need to do that. Sit down and rest, my child. Let not your heart be troubled. God is in charge of this thing because I have left you peace. It's not the peace that the world gives. Now, see, there's a difference in the peace of God and the peace of the world. 
If this thing were to subside in the next five days and people would go back to normal and, and they'd say, well, it's over, uh, there would be some kind of, some sense of peace to come over this wicked world. But it wouldn't be God's peace. It would be relief from stress, relief from the thought of dying, temporary peace. But the peace Jesus lives or gives is eternal peace from heaven, which never goes away because of a panic. It never leaves because there's trouble. No, the peace he gives says, every situation in my life is in the hand of God. All the problems of this world are under God's control. So I plead with you, my brothers, my sisters, my sheep. Don't get caught up in the rumors. Don't listen to them. Don't surf through and read as much on Facebook as you prob prob pro uh, possibly can. Most of it's not true and you're only upsetting yourself. Don't read it and don't send it. Don't send it out and say, you know, I heard. Don't do that. Let me just explain to you. If you want peace in your life, listen to God. Hey, uh, Sandra told me the other day, she's sitting behind me over here. She's not amening me. I thought maybe somebody would, but now she's laughing. I think Dennis is back there probably gigging. Greg, I hope he's awake, and uh, Jason's back there. She told me the other day that one of our daughters called and said, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't know that I'll get it exactly right. She said, Mom, I made a big mistake. What'd you do? She said, I made a really big mistake. What did you do? She said, I listened to the news before I read my Bible. And what I heard upset me. It troubled me. It set me ill at ease. And I was, I was so troubled that I told my husband and he went into his office and said, I got something for you. This is amazing to me. If you remember on New Year's Eve, we had a service here. And at the end of that service, I gave out scriptures. He kept his scripture. He went into his office and got it and brought it back and said, let me read it to you. Peace, I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives give I unto you. Isn't that amazing? Let not your heart be troubled. That's two times in the same chapter that Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Can I just tell you, if you listen to them before you hear from him, you're going to have a troubled heart. You'll be upset all day long. In fact, if you listen to them first, you won't be able to hear him because they scream and yell. He whispers. He just wants you to listen. They make you listen. They are so loud at it until they overwhelm you and they overcome you. And Jesus just whispers. He says, my peace I give to you. So let me say it for the third time. Let me emphasize it because it hit me hard yesterday. If you listen to them before you listen to him, you're going to have a rough day. But if you get up and say, I must hear from God first. His word is the only thing that matters. Theirs is rumor. It's, it's likely to change. It's in a swirl but God's word is from everlasting to everlasting and will never, ever change. I got to give you a story. It's in the third chapter of Joshua. And once again here, I never saw this until yesterday. Third chapter of Joshua. Give, give me just a moment now. In fact, if you want to get your Bible, it's Joshua chapter 3. And if you want to get something to mark in your Bible... I'm stalling now, so you can do that. 
I want you to remember this. Joshua chapter 3. You got it? <clears throat> Ready? Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. This is what's about to happen. God's promise is about to come to pass. They're going to cross over the Jordan into the promised land. <clears throat> Verse 2. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. And they commanded the people saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. You see that? Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, <clears throat> that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Oh, my, my, my. You get that? They're about to cross the Jordan. Oh, it's not as big as the Red Sea, but it's still a body of water they could not cross without the help of God. And so they camped before it and they waited on God and the officers went through the camp and said, Now, don't move until you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God on the shoulders of the priests, the Levites. When you see that then go after it. It, what is it? It's the presence of God represented by the Ark of the Covenant. It's the pillar of fire. You see, that pillar of fire stopped. It went away after they crossed the Jordan and went into the promised land. That was it for the pillar of fire and the cloud. It was Hovering over the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God in their midst. But he wasn't in their midst. He said, when you see them carrying it, go after it. Yet, now this one got me. Yet, there shall be a space between you and it. About 2,000 cubits by measure. That's half a mile. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go. <clears throat> and I pondered that, and I, I just couldn't figure out why God would say, I am the Lord God that dwells in your midst, and yet, he said, stay here, and his presence moved half a mile ahead of them. And then they were ordered, don't go close to it. I thought, Lord, why would you do that? What sense is there in separating? In fact, that's the first time I guess that God himself practiced social distancing. I never thought about that. God moved away from the people and said, I'm up there and the priest said, go after it. I know why, at least to my satisfaction. Because if God had stayed in their midst, God's presence would get entangled with their confusion and their rumors and their backbiting and their accusing. They did nothing but murmur and complain. That's what they were known for, murmuring and complaining and accusing and pointing. God said, I don't want to be in the midst of that. I'm going ahead of you. And if you will watch me and go after me, you won't get caught up in the rumors, in the confusion. If you'll keep your eyes on me, if you'll go after my presence. I wish this building were full right now. Somebody would say amen. I know it. If you'll forget about what the people around you are saying and go after it. If you'll forget about all of the accusing and the pointing and the aggravation and the murmuring and the complaining. Don't be a part of that. Go after it. But it had to be up there so they could lift their eyes from here. It had to be far enough that they had to hold up their heads and look for it. But as long as they were holding up their heads and looking for it, 
They weren't looking at all the confusion around them. And I believe with all my heart, this is to the best of my knowledge, and this is to my great spiritual satisfaction that I've come to this conclusion. If you get into the rumoring and the pointing, you are not going to hear the voice of God. If you mingle and mess with the crowd, you are going to miss it. But if you will say, I don't want to hear that, you can't substantiate that. That's only fiction. But I'm standing on what thus saith the Lord. And I won't look at what you're doing and I don't care what you're doing. I'm going after it. I'm going after him. I'm going to stand on his word. Then brother, you will cross. You'll get through it. And God will be your champion. I encourage you today, church member, Christian, don't get in it. Stay out of the mix. Don't mingle with those who are angry and irritated and political. God says, go after it. Go after my presence. Stand on my word. Oh, we're going to get through this. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times. We'll get through this. Here's the problem with all of that. The world is saying, we're going to get through this and go right back to the way we were living. We want our life to be as normal as it was. We want to do the same stuff we were doing. And God doesn't want that. Yeah, we'll get through it. Will we? I tell you what, I, have, I am not hearing from preachers on the radio or television. God is trying to get your attention, sir. God is calling for us to repent, not to get back to normal. Jesus Christ died and rose again to save this world from their sins, not just to get them through a virus. Jesus Christ walked out of a tomb one day so that he could break the power of bondage and sin in your life, not just make you well, not just let you have a doctor that can give you an injection and make you feel better. He's not wanting you to get back to your life as normal. He's wanting you to find abundant life in him and never again be tangled up in this life. So listen to me. This is about God moving, calling people to repentance. Sir, you must be born again. I do hear some generic and general references to God a lot. God's going to get us through this. Which God? Now, I'm, I feel the preacher coming on me now. I don't want to talk about a general God that the whole world can relate to. I want to talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob whose son came into this world to save us from our sins, not heal us from a germ. To take us out of the wickedness of this world. Can I tell you something, sir? Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. One of these days, the Lord is going to come to receive his church in the clouds of glory. Folks, you ought not to be thinking about getting through this so we can get back to playing golf and get back to uh, busy grocery stores and get back to cruises and vacations. You ought to be thinking, God is arresting me to get me ready to go when my time comes. I've got to stand before the judgment seat of God. You must be born again. Uh, where are the prophets and where are the preachers? who are reminding people that God is reconciling the world to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Sometimes I hear preachers say, well, you know, we're trying to relate to everybody. We don't want to just name one specific God. Folks, there's only one God. God who created all things. Any other God was created by things, people. But God came into the world not to help us get back to normal because normal will send us to hell. Normal will have you facing God 
with no plea. God came to save you from sin, save you from normal, and give you forgiveness and abundant life. So while I stand here today in this empty building looking into that red light, if this is the last sermon I ever preach, I want you to hear me. Church, Jesus is coming again. Go after it. Go after him. Forget about everything else around you. If this is the last sermon I ever preach, I want a sinner to hear me say this. You need Jesus more than you need an injection. You need the great physician more than you've ever needed, the surgeon general. Only Jesus can save you from your sins. Only Jesus can heal you from your iniquities. And only Jesus is available on the spot right now. They're telling you not to go to the hospitals if you have symptoms. We're overloaded. They're telling, oh, Lord, we're just hearing everything. But Jesus said, come to me. Come on right now. I'm not in a surgical mask. I don't have special respiratory equipment for you. You come to me. I'll heal you of all your sins and your iniquities. I will save you from your sins. So as I skim through the scriptures, this is what I found. Let me leave it with you. Isaiah 26, 3. Listen to this, church. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind stays on thee. There you go. That's going after it. Perfect peace does not come when you hear them say, this may not be as bad as we thought. Perfect peace comes when you keep your mind on him. How about this one? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. This is God's word. If Paul were standing here today, he would say, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace that passes understanding will keep your hearts and your mind by Christ Jesus. How about this one? David said, it's vain to rise up early and go to bed late worrying about things. The Lord will give rest for his beloved. No need to worry. If God takes care of birds and feeds them, and if God makes sure that flowers has clothing, then how much more will he take care of you? It is vain to worry. How about Luke chapter 10? Jesus said to Martha, 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 you are troubled and worried about many things. I can't see you, but I promise you there are people sitting there today who got up this morning scared to death. You're worried about your personal health. You're worried about the grocery stores being empty. You're worried about martial law. You're worried about people being required to stay at home. You're worried about your children. You're even worried if your dog's going to get sick. And Jesus said to you, Martha, you're worried about many things, but only one thing is needful. And he said, your sister chose that. Why? Why? What did she choose? When Jesus came to visit them, Martha got in the kitchen and worked herself into a frenzy to make a meal. Mary sat down at the feet of Jesus and said, if I eat a biscuit from there, I'll be hungry later. But if I eat bread from heaven here, I'll never be hungry again. Hallelujah. Jesus also said in Luke 12, don't seek things in this world. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them before you ask. So do not be of anxious mind. Got it? Every verse I've given you today came from the mouth of God who cannot lie, who does not change. Every verse says, I am in control. Don't worry. Don't fret. 
Don't be anxious. I, the Lord your God, will take care of you. Let me pray with you. I don't know how long I preached. I guess it was as long as I normally do. Probably too long for some. But let me explain to you one more time. God is on the throne. If God is on the throne and he is my father, I have nothing to fear. Why don't you trust him? You know, sometimes I tend to repeat myself. I'm about to do that. Go after it. <laughs> Go after it. You're in this frenzy with people and their worries and cares. The world is screaming at you. Jesus says, come with me. Go after it. Listen to God and you'll have perfect peace in your life. You know, I'm, I'm one to say that every message needs a response. I believe this one does. So I'm going to say to anybody that might be troubled, you can get down right where you are. Maybe you can get your family's hand and get down. First of all, be thankful that God is taking care of you. But then ask Him to give you greater faith. Go after it. Go after Him. Listen to Him before you listen to them. May the Lord bless you. And He has. May the Lord keep you. And He has. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you. And he is. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And he did. And may the Lord give you peace. And it's in Jesus. Have a great day. Bye-bye. I'll see you tomorrow night.